We're on. Yep. All right. Thanks very much. Sorry, we've um, we're a little bit disorganised over here, but uh, we're we're getting there. We've had a few uh, sort of late withdrawals and and people still putting in videos right up until a couple of hours ago. So it's been um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a hodgepodge getting everything together, but. Um, I wanted to start by introducing myself. I'm Richard Watley. I work for the Kimberley Land Council. I'm the official title strategic fire operations officer, um, basically just a fire ops officer um, based in Broome. Uh, and, and at the Kimberley Land Council, we, we really try and support all of the, the range groups Kimberley wide. Um, I'll start with a few of those apologies that I, I mentioned. Um, DBCA, Parks and Wildlife. Uh, I don't know if everybody's seen, but there's been some terrible fires um, down near Perth, so so they've been called down there. Um, but I've got a note here from Erin Tassel, who says that she'll provide a brief update to attendees as a document um, at a later date, um, if anybody's interested in DBCA's burning this year. Um, we've got Nudera Rangers on the line from Fitzroy Crossing, which we'll have to throw to later. Um, and we'll try our best to get that functioning. I've, spoken to them, but I think that Chantal is on the line there, so that'll be a really great talk. Um, we've got Alec Hoggett um, from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy um, next to us. You probably can't see our video at the moment. Can they see us? Oh, they can see us. All right, well, there's Alec. Um, and, and then John Wheelock from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services over here. Um, and as I said, we've got a few videos coming from range groups and pastoralists. Um, and they're really great. So we'll do our best to move through pretty quickly um, and get everybody through. Um, but yeah, 2020, same as pretty much everywhere, it looks like it was a really complicated year for the operators up here. And that was due to some of the conditions which we'll talk about later. Um, how are we swapping? All right. So this is a map of the fire project areas by organisation in the Kimberley. Um, there's a large number of operators and, and a lot of fire projects that are grant supported on that map. Um, there are carbon projects functioning in the Kimberley and you can see them pictured there. Um, Ballingara, Willigan, Dummy Manyari, Nulliga and Woodabulgumbra all have registered projects. Um, AWC, the Eco Fire Program, they run a few partnerships with different groups as well, which Alan will talk about. Um, and I just want you to note those dark green outlines, that's all pastoral lease boundaries. So really complicated working relationships up here. Um, and there has to be a lot of respect and cooperation between pastoralists and ranger groups up here. And, and John will talk a little bit about that um, shortly. Um, those pastoral leases, a lot of them are operational pastoral leases, which cover some of the fire project areas too, um, which can further complicate things. But um, it's, it's, it's a really evolving um, program up here. It's really good. Um, so this slide here shows the 11 range groups that the KLC assisted with fire program delivery in 2020. Um, a good spread all the way from the North Kimberley um, down into the desert. Um, a lot of these groups um, are administering projects themselves, so the support really differs um, from us. If we can help anything from planning right up to delivery um, on those projects. So only two of those groups have carbon projects that we help, Ballangar and Nalaga. Um, and then because of the, the, the carbon projects <coughs> providing income to those groups, um, they're able to manage really good fire programs, but the other groups need to maintain really strong partnerships um, because most of their programs function on grants. So we work with the National Land Care Program, Rangelands NRM, 10 Deserts Project, which is that orange boundary down the bottom in those um, groups to the south. Um, WWF, DFES over here, Bushfire Centre of Excellence, NESP and EK, uh, of course, DBCA and Parks and Wildlife and AWC all work with Ranger Groups too. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank all our support, uh, all our partners for their support um, through this last year um, with all those associated COVID-19 protocols. It was really difficult to manage and I'm sure that's coming through in, in all of the other talks today too. Um, and in particular, DFES WA Superintendent Grant Pike worked really hard 
um, to secure the ranges, the, um, the essential service providers provision, which meant that they were able to travel and complete their fire programs. Um, and that's, that's a testament to the ranges, really important work on the ground um, in these complicated working conditions. So um, yeah, thanks very much DFES for that. Oops. So how does the KLC work? Um, we've got two fire officers that travel extensively throughout the early and late season operations, Kimberley wide. Um, groups that have moved away from the KLC are still supported at every opportunity, um, and that's through training, um, or at times direct on ground help when there's short staffing or, or funding issues, we'll travel out and, and help those groups as well. Um, the small team that work with the Rangers to deliver programs, um, we base uh, the outcomes on the right way fire principles. Um, and, and many of the fire managers on the conference today have been involved throughout the development of the KLC program. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of people over the last you know, 10, 11 years that have really um, helped to develop this. Um, the program has diversified in recent years with many groups growing independence um, and having that ability to run their own fire and carbon projects where it's viable. Um, and, and the reduced funding from grants has, has actually meant that, that, that increased collaboration um, has, has increased and, and so is the professionalism of the, the fire program and, and the dedication of the rangers in fire management on the ground. So as more groups are taking on those greater responsibilities and, and the confidence grows, um, the, the program is always uh, is really dynamic. Um, and, and this year, those COVID protocols that came in um, actually forced many of the groups to take on extra responsibilities in their program. It, it actually promoted some, some good outcomes there. Um, and, and also um, insurance is, is a bit of an issue for us up here too, but um, we we'll try and avoid talking about that too much because it's a, a really complex problem at the moment that we're all dealing with. Um, training, um, it's a really essential part of the program. Um, the KLC aims to ultimately equip all of the ranges to manage their own fire project areas. Um, we also complete a lot of informal on-the-job training in things like GIS uh, and general operations. Um, we have a nationally accredited conservation land management program that we run with um, North Regional TAFE, um, and, and that's part of the development pathway for rangers. Um, and we've got really, really good trainers in the Kimberley too um, at NR TAFE, and they, they tailor that program to the rangers, which helps a lot. Um, and DFES uh, also provides some really solid training to the rangers um, and, and both Broomshire and DVCA. Um, they're hoping to combine with some of the KLC groups in the near future as well. So we're really moving forward in that respect. Um, and, and this year, even with the limitations uh, with COVID, 62 rangers and TOs completed the specific fire training subjects Kimberley wide. So that was a really good outcome too. Um, and in the picture, you'll note it's really good to see that um, everyone's got their fire retardant basketball singlets and pluggers on, common feature up here, which is great. Um, so just to talk about the conditions a little bit, um, this is the rainfall in the 12 months to April 2020. So April is the traditional start of most of the group's early season burning. Um, and, and we're actually able to begin burning in February um, in that year, in some parts of the East Kimberley. Um, and then we had some more rainfalls in May that complicated the early season programs too, um, as a result. So the 12 month period rainfall leading into our burning season in 2020, this is the 24 month rainfall leading into that early season burning period in April, 2020. And that, that really gives you a good indication of why it was so difficult. Um, a lot of the Kimberley is um, below average, very much below average and, and lowest rainfalls on record um, over that um, Kimberley project area. Um, and that gives us an indication uh, of some of the complications that rangers face this year. A lot of the two-year-old fuels were behaving like one-year-old fuels generally would. Um, the older fuels wouldn't go out in many of the project areas. It was really tricky to juggle the conditions um, this year with our burning projects. Um, so at the end of 2019, with late onset across much of the Kimberley, um, most of the groups, especially in the northeast and the northwest, suffered extensive late season fires. So those fire scars with that low rainfall didn't really recover. Um, and and that, that really complicated a lot of the burning in those areas too. Um, 
And we also had some of the early season fires. You'll see some quite large early season fire scars in that map too. So the early season fire scars are in the green, anything from January to July, and late season is August to December. Well, if you're trying to do really effective early season burning um, and, and you're having these um, big fires happening in sort of May, um, that further complicates things um, in 2019. So, so um, it was, yeah, it was, it was really tough. Um, and, and the reason that that happened as well is because a lot of people sort of pulled up their programs due to the dry conditions the previous year. And then we didn't have enough burns in the landscape. So fires, those late season fires really ran um, hard throughout the landscape. And, and, you know, it was a bad year, but we did learn um, a lot of lessons from that. So what did we do in 2020 in response? We increased our efforts. Um, we burned for a longer period, February all the way through July. Um, we used many more incendiaries, a, a huge increase in helicopter time. Um, and even with COVID, a lot more range groups getting out by themselves and delivering that burning. So it, it was positive in a way, some of those bad fires, not, not in a carbon perspective, but um, in an operations perspective. So this sort of illustrates a bit of the extra effort um, in one of the project areas that we assist with, um, the Nulliga fire project area. Um, that's our chopper lines. So we, we basically um, increased our effort 100% that year in response to, to these conditions that, that we saw. Um, and it was really um, quite difficult to break up the fuels in that project area because of the, the differences in the rainfall and the landforms across the project. Um, up sort of in the, the northeast of the project, a lot of spin effects dries out really quickly. We were able to burn that in sort of February, March, and then down towards Gibb River on the western side there, it remained really wet. Um, a lot of the grasses were only just starting to sort of seed in May. So we had to keep on going and going and spreading our time across that project area. It becomes very um, expensive and quite hard to do. But one of the things that really helped us this year is we received some extra support in mapping from the NAFI team. So thanks very much. Um, NAFI, um, they, they helped us with some Sentinel-2 scar mapping that, and they provided that to us um, and we were able to do really effective burning as a result of that help. Um, so that was great. Um, we also received some, some really much needed help um, from the rainfalls this year. So uh, on the left there, that's, that's the rainfall for October to December in 2019. And that's why those fires weren't stopping um, when usually they would be um, late sort of in the dry and you know you get those early rains and the onset happens and those fires don't run well we didn't get it so we still had a lot of fires running through all the way through to the end of December I know that in Arnhem Land people are still out firefighting as well so um, really difficult year um, but this year uh, look at the difference early onset much easier to manage those fires, um, those late season fires with a bit more humidity around as well, not just the rainfall, but a bit more humidity um, helped us out. And then this is a contrasting map for the end of 2020. So this is our burning um, to the end of 2020, not a lot of late season um, fire scars. And because of that increased effort, we did stop a lot of those late season fire scars from fires from developing. Um, so it was a really fantastic year for almost all of the projects um, and the ranges increased effort had real results. Um, so really well delivered, um, great effort by all of the ranges in 2020. And those late season suppression opportunities, because they weren't large out of control bushfires, we got a lot of opportunity to practice with um, remote insertion um, operations. I know Allard and, and, and AWC did a lot of that, so I'm, I'm sure we'll hear about them. Um, um, one of Wagamba did a bit of um, remote insertion as well for the first time. Um, so it was a really good opportunity um, and, you know, we made use of that. So Arun's just jumped out of the room at a critical point um, because we are going to swap over to the Nutra Ranges now um, in Fitzroy Crossing. Um, and I do not know how to do that. <laughs> hey, everyone. Putting me under the bus. Um, we just got to get Nutra up. Do you reckon you can help us make Nutra presenters? See, so they're sitting there. Yep, there we go. Yep. <laughs> there we go. 
is our microphone still on? So this is um, Chantal from Nudera and Raylene. Yeah, good, good morning. Can everybody hear me as well? Yep. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, morning, my name is Kevin. I, I um, work with Chantel and Raylene uh, as a country manager. Um, I'm calling in from Broomtown and Chantel and Emily are in Fitzroy Crossing. Over to you guys, Chantel, Emily. Just mute. Um, we probably have any technical problems here. <laughs> I don't know everything. You are. I am sharing the screen. Yeah, we can see the screen and we can see yeah, you. Can you, oh, good. Oh, good. Can you guys see yeah. the screen? Yeah, yeah we, we can see it. the screen Don't and we can see okay. you. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. This is no, really no. new to this sharing screen stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, we. I'm the woman ranger coordinator for uh, Ngurra and uh, we manage um, Ngurra country approximately 100 uh, square kilometers in the Great Sandy Desert. Um, and we also deal with pastoralists, tourists um, along the Canning Stock Roads and um, mainly our area is um, Jilla country um, and Jilji country with the sand dune and um, living waterholes. And as you can see on the map um, with our, the fire scars that's there, you know, um, we, we've got one of the biggest areas that's in the Kimberley and it's very remote. The only way to access it is through um, chopper and um, fit wing. Uh, and most of our burning is done with that. As you can see the red lines on the map, um, that's our flight, flight lines. And mainly we do a um, lot of burning with our traditional owners on country. Um, and the rangers normally do a lot of planning around that um, with them because uh, there are heaps of sensitive areas and Raylene will touch base on that in the next slide. Cultural burning has been used as a tool for hunting in our area. Um, also for the clearances when there has been um, a loss in the family. Uh, also um, signal as emergency, working in two ways, cultural and Western ways. Um, Spinifex is the main fuel that um, was lit during these activities. Uh, what are people and ranges use water fire by combining traditional knowledge and Western science to keep country healthy and alive. So more, one of the ranger teams that we've got, we've got two ranger teams and one of them is women. We've managed one of the women ranger groups as well. And um, mainly our planning is around um, traditional ways of how women can work on, on country using the tools um, of fire um, and, you know, using Western science as well and combining that together to make it work out on country and, and keeping it healthy and alive for the wildlife out there that we've got. Um, also, we, our challenges as women ranges out on country is um, where to burn and where not to burn and the guidance that the traditional owners give us is a big, big help towards our uh, ranger project when we're going out for burning. Um, our planning 
based around is uh, connection to country, plants and animals, and main thing is for the seasons. This is one of our project area. Um, Kevin will touch base on this um, in the next slide. But one of our project area runs on the, um, along the Kenning Stock Route. Uh, and some of the areas we can access with vehicles, and most of them is uh, with chopper and um, Fitzwing. And throughout this project that we do on the Kenning Stock Route, um, we get to get good support from um, 10 deserts. Uh, to be able to run this program and also KLC. Um, it helps us to prevent the late season fires that's coming from the east. And when we do a joint venture burning with um, the ranges at um, Bujiranga, um, Karajiri ranges, that helps prevent the late season burn coming from the west and also the south with the um, model ranges. Kevin. Yeah, thanks Chantel. Um, that's that's great. Um, I think it came through pretty, pretty strongly that a, 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 all of our work is, is strongly underpinned through uh, cultural protocol. So we, um, we always take the, the TOs out with us, traditional owners for, for the areas um, out with us. And we make sure that we're, we're kind of using all this fantastic technology that's at our, at our fingertips these days and all this uh, great support that we get from, um, from, from funding bodies and, um, uh, and partners. Uh, and we make sure that that's, that's strongly centered in uh, a, a cultural protocol and and we try and use uh, traditional burning techniques in a in a in a modern context. So that's really kind of you know the, making sure that patchiness is there and um, uh, look, looking after uh, uh, cultural spots, um, burning around gillers to make sure uh, that oh, cultural right. protocols are, are, are overseen that way. Um, no, it's only for the. Indian so this uh, ten ten desert yeah, uh -huh. project area, we uh, received funding from oh, yeah, cool. uh, yeah, 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 ten yeah, deserts yeah, to um, administer a uh, good fire practice within that within that area. So that's that kind of yeah. circle circle area there. Sorry, I think I'm I'm getting a bit of feedback. What? I think somebody's got their mic on. <laughs> um, uh, so within that area. We, we receive funding to do as best yeah, be practice uh, fire burning as, as, as possible. So um, it's, it's intensive um, fire management. And, and what we really want to do is, is understand how um, desert burning reacts to, to a good way fire regime and try and replicate that in the bigger area. Uh, as Chantel said, we've got a, a, a hundred thousand square kilometers of, of country um, so it's a it's a huge area to to chip away at. Um, particularly, I might just jump back a slide if I if I can. I might have to get you to do that, Chantel. Just jump back a, a, a few slides, um, maybe one more with that big map, and you'll see that in 2017 we had a a, a massive yeah that's the one we had a a, a massive burning uh, a fire event that. Uh, went right down the, the middle of uh, Nordic country. You can see that, uh, that, that fire scar, that kind of pale sandy color. Um, so essentially that just dialed our management back to ground zero. Uh, uh, it's a really challenging job. Obviously there's no roads in there. Um, we're lucky to get support from, uh, um, from DBCA, from uh, Parks and Wildlife, uh, uh, the, Aboriginal Ranger Program um, and 10 Deserts, KLC and a few other uh, funding bodies to enable us to get out there with, with, with choppers to, to tackle that area. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, gonna be a massive challenge trying to introduce some patchiness into that area. Uh, but this, you know, moving forward, we've got good support from, from funding bodies and, um, and, and partners uh, and we'll just uh, we'll chip away at it. Um, good to see some photos coming out of the desert after this rainfall events recently. 
that there that area is probably looking like it would burn this year. So we'll um, we'll have our work cut out for us this year, trying to trying to bring that back. Uh, and largely, um, you know, we'll be uh, using the the KLC to to help us uh, um, to get stuck into that area. Uh, I think that's about me, Chantel. Do you want to jump forward to that last slide? Yeah. So this, uh, I will just mention that it's 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 incredibly tricky. We're um, burning in, um, in in Spinifex country, where you know Nutara can draw on you know thousands and thousands of years of of of, of traditional burning. Uh, in, a, in a modern context with, uh, with airplanes and um, IMO uh, um, uh, technology, um, it's actually proving quite challenging to, to, to get the right mix. Uh, we can um, burn too early and then just nothing is just, nothing goes. And then all of a sudden it all comes online at that kind of five to six to seven year old spin effects. Uh, and then, you know, after a, a big rain event like this this year, uh, we run the risk of of, of 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 putting too much fire in there. So it's it's quite tricky, uh, and we're really only into the, the third or, or fourth year of of really uh, targeted uh, fire management with with choppers. Um, so we've still got our got our L plates on a little bit, and uh, we're really trying to. Uh, use this um, project area to, to fully understand, you know, age uh, age group of uh, spin effects and, and how the fire can uh, uh, travel through that. Um, I think that's about that's about us. Um, yeah, I think uh, we look forward to to getting stuck into it this year once it dries out. Once we can actually get out there, it's an incredibly wet year for us. So. Um, we look forward to, uh, to, to, have, to cracking on this year. Thanks, Richo, back to you. All right, can you hear us? Thanks, Trumpy. Um, so what we might do, and, and that was a great talk, by the way, thanks very much, um, Chantelle and Raylene, that was, that was awesome, um, and, and Trumpy. We'll just... Um, try and get through a couple of people in the office and then we might um, might get into some range of presentations. I might get John Wheelock just to give a, a quick summary now um, of the, the DFES burning program. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invite, Richie. Um, my name's uh, John Wheelock. I'm District Officer for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services uh, for Central Kimberley. Uh, apologies, I don't really have a slide. So we've got some conflicting um, priorities at the moment with what's happening around the region and the state. Um, I'm going to provide just a quick overview of the 2020 aerial burning program that we conduct up here. Um, most of our aerial burning is conducted with pastoral stations, probably 95% of it uh, deals with the pastoral leases. Um, it's important to note, I suppose, too, that we probably DFES, Department of Fire and Emergency Services, are the, one of the smallest players or are the smallest player in the Kimberley region uh, in terms of uh, aerial control burning. Um, so out of, out of the uh, 70 or 80 plus pastoral stations we've got up in the Kimberley, 23 of these subscribed to the aerial burning program. Um, and I've, Rich used to touch on it before about uh, reasons why uh, the, the season was bad in terms of the weather and rain or lack of rain. Um, that, that's why we didn't get a, a larger uptake than in previous years. But having said, said that, over the 23 uh, pastoral stations, we did about uh, approximately 400, uh, 408,000 uh, hectares of um, lands that we put fire into, I suppose. Um, with, the, with our program, we have a uh, set budget, so um, we don't have the opportunity, uh, once we, we put some, uh, or go over a, a, a pastoral station, we don't have the opportunity in most cases to go back and visit that and join up the, uh, the um, holes in, in or the gaps in the, in the fire scars. So uh, whereas uh, Richie's touched on it before about being able to go back and um, it later on in the season and, and join up those dots, I suppose, in the, in the fire scars to make sure we've got a good area there. Uh, but hopefully things in that area might be changing. 
Um, our the conditions for this year were um, we touched on before, um, but our conditions when we started our prescriptions, we sort of uh, meet with the pastoralists and they give us an indication when they'd like to start their program. And that's obviously got to fit in with what their work requirements are throughout the year as well. Um, but for us, the prescribed conditions were uh, well below um, than what we expected. It was dis discontinuous fuel. We didn't have really the wind to push the fire in, so probably low consumption rates and penetration of the fire into, into the landscape. So um, it probably wasn't really uh, that well affected early on the season. Um, additional to the pastoral stations, we conduct roadside birds burning this year. And um, whilst COVID-19 was probably a negative in, in this, this respect, it was a bit of a positive because of uh, the tourist industry that uh, we experienced in the dry season wasn't around. So we took that opportunity and we, um, we, we sort of burned the road verges from Broome to Halls Creek. Um, and what we did there, we ended up doing about 1,900 kilometres of roadside verge burning. Um, we obviously didn't put fire in all the way along those lines. We sort of broke it up into five or 10 kilometre buffers. Um, the reason we do that is obviously environmental reasons, but also um, if a fire is going to impact the road, it's only a five to 10 kilometre uh, buffer that's going to hit. And it also allows our volunteer brigades, groups and units to respond to a small portion of that road to deal with that fire and uh, if, if we need to close the roads to its reduced amount of time. So that was fairly effective this year. Um, for us, the, uh, things that happened for COVID for us is we, in, early on in the piece, we normally have a partial in the helicopter with us um, um, following our flight lines and requesting where we drop in sandries. Uh, for this year, we couldn't do that. We, we couldn't have the partials in there. So uh, a bit of working around the background. Um, we come up with alternatives for how we can how we how, how we can achieve this and um, you know put some fire into the landscape and and reduce the threat of late season fires. Um, but once we got that in play, we we sort of got that um, yeah got got that worked on and, and implemented. Um, so additionally to that, uh, what we look after up here is um, town site unallocated crown land and unmanaged reserves, uh, and we mostly conduct them with using drip torch or hand burning. Um, we work really close with the range groups as well and we assist with them where we can and where the budget allows. Um, and that's really about it for me. All right, thanks, John. Um, what we might do now is we've had a few uh, submissions from different ranger groups um, in terms of, of little videos. And um, we've got this one here from uh, Nil Nil Rangers uh, up in the the near um, the Dampier Peninsula around Beagle Bay. Um, so this is a presentation from Preston Cox. I just need to put him as full screen. So I get him across there. All right. So this is yeah Preston Cox, who is one of the fire managers, or he's the chief um, fire ranger from New New Rangers. Um, and this is a presentation on his 2020 fire season. Just this video clip is the first burn we did for the 2020 season was behind the powerhouse. Uh, this, again, it's the first time we took the drone out. It did burn really well again to the tree line and went out. Summer is we had to do double lines again, vegetation was patchy. This PowerPoint is roadside burns we did. Uh, the left one is uh, the main road. So from the Cape we go from Nine Mile, where we usually start towards Bulk to the south of the community. Again, some places burnt really well, so other places didn't because of vegetation thickness. The one on the right is red soil, or the Parikajura, which Parikajuk Road, which is one of the main access roads for local fishing areas, places in the area. Did a bird along there that went really well, as you can tell by the smoke.
On this clip, we are burning to the east uh, at Lajido Bay or the east of the um, native title termination. Uh, when we did this burn, we actually hired casual employees from that clan, family, and did the burns with them. That went really well, especially through the lakes. Some of the other areas did not, again, did not burn as well due to vegetation thickness. I'm uh, looking at doing the same this year, hiring cashew from that area. Um, with this burn, like I said before, if, uh, infrastructure is one of our main priorities. Uh, you can see from the clips in here, the boys are doing a clearing around the buildings so we can get a burn in with the drip torch, which is done on the right clip. Uh, in the middle is one of the ranges with a blower, just in case the fire gets it to other hand, just to make sure. Um, final note, um, all in all, the 2020 burn season was pretty successful, didn't go as well as planned, but I guess the big plus to the year is that we didn't have as much fire or wildfires as previous years, which is a big deal. Um, again, issues we've had this year is vegetation density, so not, I, I sent through the clip, um, wasn't too well. Um, tried to use the wind as best possible, but because of the limit of wind to help push fire along it. Again, didn't go as well as planned. Other than that, I think we've had a pretty good 2020 prescribed burn season. Thank you for listening. All right, so thanks very much for that one, Preston. Um, another good presentation there. Um, what I might do now is, is I will uh, head into straight into another presentation apologies if we go over time if somebody just lets us know if that's an issue or not um, we've got a, quite a few videos that have been submitted so I, i'm just trying to get through some of these range of videos because they're, they're really good they've put in a lot of effort um, this one's from uh, Woonabugumbra up in the north uh, one second i've got a run yelling at me <laughs> yeah run. share it Sorry, we'll get it going in a second. Maybe just go back to the start of that one. Thanks, everyone. for a new regrowth and for to keep the country healthy for the animals. Oh, it's burning on the outside to protect the outside and got good carbon rating. Uh, lightning fire started by a lightning. It went up there with the helicopter and fought it. Okay, it's come closer to the infrastructure and buildings.
All right, that was a great video. Thanks very much to WG for that one. Um, really good program up there, um, well supported by Bush Heritage, Tom Vigilani, um, and some really good rangers um, like Ildefons um, up there working. So, so they're, they're going really well up north now. Um, I'm going to play one more presentation here that we got in from Garajati Rangers, who are also um, down in the desert. Um, we'll see how we go. Arun, do you want to give us a hand with this one, mate? Um, Garajati, sort of next door to Nudura, to the west of, of Nudura, and they've put this video together for us. Um, just sent it in today. So, this one? Yep, that's the one. Thanks, Arun. Uh, morning, this is Braden Taylor. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Garajari Monitoring and Fire Operation 2020. Garajari Bira and Jungle Project. Our projects surrounding fire and biodiversity help traditional owners, rangers understand and improve the fire management. Cultural knowledge surrounding fire management over our IPA. Garajari people hold some knowledge surrounding traditional fire management. But for us to develop our monitoring framework, we have asked from our partner, help from our partners, NEFS and EK. Uh, these are some results uh, for our ground cover. Fire has a big impact on the ground cover. Straight after a fire, there's more bare ground. Uh, over time, the leaf litter and grass cover increases. The amount of bare ground decreases. If there hasn't been a fire for a long time, bottle can start crowding out the ground. Some results. Uh, reptiles also change with time since fire. The number of reptile species and the reptile abundance was lowest in the first year after a fire. How each reptile species responds to fire depends on the lifestyle and how much it lies on the ground cover. Species that live on the ground surface are more sensitive to fire than species that live in the trees or that burrows are underground. Some of our conclusions, fire reduces the number of reptiles, species, and their abundance. Community recovers over about five years. We should aim to keep fire less than once every five years. More frequent uh, fire could knock some species about, especially the ones that live on the surface and are active during the day or the species that are rare. As our management changes fire regimes, we expect to see the these fire sensitive species increase in abundance. Yeah, good day, Ewan Noakes, Garajadi Ranger Coordinator here. Um, just going to give an update on our weather stations project. Um, we got some money um, in 2019 to develop and install four weather stations on, on our IPA. Um, we've successfully installed three stations and they're up and running. Um, we can access that information. Um, over the internet and it gives us real real weather observations um, occurring on the IPA which is great um, for us when we're conducting our, our firework. Uh, the fourth weather station is due to go in this year. Um, we're looking at installing that one down in the southeastern corner of our IPA um, and we've been working with our project partners EK and Toby Barton to develop um, a, a better, more user-friendly interface um, that the rangers can use that will, that will be set up at our ranger base. Um, we, we, we're happy to share um, information about the cost of these weather stations and what's involved in getting them out with other groups. Um, yeah, we think it's a great, it's a great initiative and uh, yeah, allows us to get, you know, real-time weather updates. Um, that, that's, that goes a long way to improve our fire management. Garajari Fire Ops 2020. The light green areas on the map represent the one to three year old grasses. We know that this grass doesn't burn. Last year, we targeted five year grass to reduce patch sizes. The dots on the map represent our fire monitoring sites. 
by the bursaries. Uh, last year, we started ground burning operation in March, using some old roads into the desert. As rain is put in some really good early season burns targeting five-year-old grass. We know from monitoring that keeping patches of five-year-old grass is good for plants and animals. Uh, breaking these patches up is very important. Uh, thanks for listening to graduate presentation. Hope you enjoyed it and have a nice day. All right, another great preso there from GoJuddy. Thanks very much for submitting that um, too. That was really, really good. There's, there's some really good work going on down in the desert at the moment, and a lot of that seems to be um, uh, uh, kicked along by the 10 Deserts Project. It's, it's been really beneficial down there, um, enabling a bit more funding for people to... Um, to, to get burning done and to get that training done. So it's been a really good outcome. Um, now, what I'm going to do is try and work my way through the slides for Bertie, um, who is up in Ballangara in the North Kimberley. And this one's going to be a little bit complicated. Sorry, we've just got to open the Prezzo and I'll cycle through these slides while Bertie talks on this one. Uh, oh, one sec. Hey. All right, thanks, everyone. So if you go back and share that preso. Uh, Ballango Rangers 2020 for Darwin. Oh, no, 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 not that one. Two. Oh. Go share the screen. All right. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is James Birch Gallagher. I'm the Assistant Ranger Coordinator at Bellinger Rangers in Wyndham. Uh, we're just talking about our fire season for 2020. Just wanted to say that, um, last year, we, um, it wasn't too bad a season, but the year before 2019, it was a really bad season. We had a lot of really late season fires that were really big and, yeah, and it was a really bad season. Um, Bellinger is um, over a million hectares and um, pretty big area to um, get out and burn in a lot of the remote areas uh, not very many tracks to get um, to go out and burn off so very limited access but we do a lot of ground burning uh, especially last year because of the COVID restrictions we weren't allowed in the chopper with Richard and the pilot so we did a lot of ground burning as well um, right go to the next slide okay um, in our operations in 2020, we delivered a lot of fuel to um, Umari, which is a Jibang airport airstrip at the King George there, it's pretty remote. Um, and we also delivered some fuel out to Umbulgari, to the airstrip there. Um, and yeah, um, bloody just just to be ready for our season this year. So that's why we had to do that. And um, we also had a meeting, a fire planning meeting at the end of last year, with all our neighbors and partners and a few TOs. So that was good to have that done nice and early last year. Um, next slide. Uh, in, in regards to our training, we do IMO first thing in the early season, uh, probably February, March as early as possible because our season starts what April, May and June so we try and have it done before we actually start our fire season um, and all the ranges required to do Cert 2 uh, and um, prescribed burning and working safely, safely around aircraft and we also do IMO training to help uh, use the rain dance machine that we use in the chopper and the, the aircraft so everybody's familiar familiar with that, uh, and then um, and all the guys are re required to do CO three in uh, firefighting as well. So yeah, that's 
Um, next slide. Uh, just, just saying that you know, last year we had um, really sort of mixed year because of um, COVID uh, 19 conditions and re I mean restrictions. So we had to just be very careful how we go about our business. And we, in the beginning, it was pretty slow because we did a lot of ground burning because we weren't allowed in the chopper. And then in the, towards the end of the season, we were allowed in the chopper. So we started to um, fly around a bit more in the chopper and you know, doing more area work. Um, and like, you know, from looking at 2019, when we had that really horrible season, a lot of late season fires. Um, it was really hard to get fire started in some places on Bellagara country. So we had to continuously go back and forth, backwards and forth. Yeah, so, yeah, that was really good. And then, like from this slide, you can see where the purple lines are, those are flight lines. And um, we burned, what, 21.6% of the country. And that was early season burning. So we sort of met our target. We try and aim for tw between 20 and 30, you know. Um, and, uh, and, even, and like in the late season, we even had 1% burn in the late season as well, which was really good compared to 2019. It was a really good season. So, um, you know, we're back on track to recover from our 2019 fires, which is great. So country um, will be able to we'll probably have a bit more fuel on, on the ground to play with this year. So we don't have to be going up and down, up and down like a bloody yo-yo. Um, and then like from the start, from this, from this slide here, you can see the scars, um, where, where we burnt, where a late season fire got out of hand in near Umbulgari there, and, um, and, it, and it got pulled up in our early season burn that we did in the beginning, in the beginning of the year. So it just shows how, if you do it properly, you know, you can, it can work out right for you. So that was great. Um, yeah, and just thank you for listening and I'll just say that we had a really good soft fire season last year. Thank you. All right, thanks for that one, Bertie. That was a really good prezo. Um, we've just had uh, Dumby Ranges, Dumby Mungari Ranges come into the office. Um, I'm not sure if you can see us on the camera. A room. Do you stop, stop sharing? Uh, yep, stop sharing. Okay. Can they see us or not? So we've got Pete here. Pete, I'll let you introduce yourself and, and do your talk. And we've got some female ranges in the room as well. Um, and you're, yeah, you're right to talk there. Yeah, we'll just talk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I guess, um, good afternoon, everybody that's um, checking in. And just want to acknowledge the that we're um, carrying on and broadcasting too. I guess just a little recap of um, Dumpy's fire season. I don't have any fancy photos or graphs or anything this time. Um, those, those that know me, I presented last year in town. But I've got my two cousins here that um, I guess done a really uh, major effort with the Dumpy fire season uh, last year. Um, as you can see with a lot of the range groups here, the Kimberleys, with the rainfalls that um, you know, didn't really come and made it a bit difficult. It was a bit hard, um, but also with um, COVID as well, it was a, a lot hard to do a lot of work with the choppers and stuff because um, you know everybody's you know, kind of locking down with the COVID stuff. So last year what had happened was um, Trisha and Sherilyn here, they went out on uh, Dumpy Country for three months, actually, um, out to, Beverly Springs and isolated out there. And um, they were doing a lot of the fire work for Dumby out there, um, just flying back and forth to places, doing groundwork. Um, I guess they can do a little touch on um, how they enjoyed it out there and uh, kind of, it was a bit different to our fire seasons from previous years. Uh, what, what were some of the, I guess, positives that you um, enjoyed out in Beverly Springs? I guess one of the negatives would be being away from family. Yeah, but um, everything really went all right. Um, 
Yeah, coming together when AWC and uh, London Rangers. Um, yeah, but I uh, really, really turned on the right. Um, they're flying in a uh, badly spring. Um, They were working with them. Yeah, yeah because, um, besides just flying in and out during the burn, we also did some ground burning around the um, home set and that. Um, yeah, other little jobs that we did as well to keep ourselves occupied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, um, yeah, with the government that did step in, um, a lot of the other guys in town, like I, I was town based, and some of the other guys are part of the ranger crew was part of the community. So it was sort of like really separated. It was, it was like kind of um, a long way from each other. And it was um, good to see like these ladies stepping up, um, doing this um, fire season for us. You know, they basically did most of the work yeah. out there during, during this fire season. And, Seeing a lot of their Snapchats and stuff, they have a lot of fun <laughs> in their downtown catching barrows and stuff. And I guess that's one way to go about the time while you're out there. But I'm um, also just looking at the you know the cultural significance on fire and, and why the carbon project you know it's you know well funded and it helps out with the communities and the the ranger groups and the people and um, for the country. But you know the, the cultural significance of fire, um, you know, to me to the, like today I kind of realised. Um, how much it actually means to us people, you know, from, you know, we call it, um, what deep word did we use them for? Oh. What do you say for fire? When you say for fire, we talk, we say for fire. We talk, we say when you say But, um, you know, we use it for cooking, we use it for smoking. When we go to a country, we use it to introduce people. People use it as a signal. Um, we use it for ceremony, we use it for when people uh, will lose and stuff. And um, I guess when we look at the kind of the bigger picture, the guys that kind of get, you know, the carbon credit stuff us, I guess it's when we do our presentations and stuff, we kind of acknowledge them for, you know, helping us out with the carbon credits. But I think it's kind of, kind of switch it over to say, hey, um, acknowledge the people like these girls that have, and ranges, you know, through the northern Australia that go out and actually do this work and, you know, they kind of have their big forums and carbon credits and stuff, or how would you bring us to them and we can speak to people uh, more often. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of just a little bit of a recap. But uh, um, on W's fire project this year, and last year, and hopefully we'll have a good year this one, not a lot of wet this, this time, so yeah. it might be a little bit difficult, a bit more later into the season. Yeah. But yeah, I just keep it short and sweet and simple. Yes. Thank you guys for having us. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you all next four. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Um, yep. Excellent preso there from Dumby. Um, and yeah, one of the really important things that um, Peter's just mentioned is um, the, 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 it's not just about carbon. It, 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 it is really about a whole lot of add-ons that the money from carbon provides, that the time on country and all those sorts of things. Um, so we're pretty much 10 minutes over time. Uh, is it okay if we have one more quick presentation from Allard um, from AWC? I'm not getting any messages, so I'll just assume that it is okay. Um, Allard and, and AWC run a massive fire project up here, and they, they work with a lot of partners like Dumby um, and Willigan. So I'll just get Allard's presentation open here. It is, which one? Ah, Allard, I'll get it. You had to. I'll just use um, this one. Use a PDF, fine. Oh, yep, PDF. And the room. Share screen. Okay. Okay, going to be a whiz of this soon. Uh, this one. Yeah, if we just go full screen. Yep, I'll um, just bring him down so I can hit that thing. Okay. If you go to view. Oh. Yep. And full screen. Aha. Uh -huh. Thanks. All right, go for so it, I'll just, just quick to go through that. Yeah, just a little. 
So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of, uh, of the land from which we're speaking at the moment, but also the traditional owners that we work with right across the Kimberley. Um, today, as Rich said, I'm the operations manager for AWC in the Northwest. And I'd like to talk just about a couple of things quickly. During the last fire season, we ran two processes side by side. One was to lay out our early dry season burning program in collaboration with our partners and neighbours. And the second was to, um, was to develop the processes we use. Uh, and I'll just move to the next slide. The reason we need to start thinking a little more strategically about our fire management is we, we are now uh, involved in fire management over a very large area, over 6 million hectares. There's 1.2 million hectares of AWC leases or subleases, uh, leases that we, we have control over, um, the pastoral aspects of, and then there's 3.1 million hectares of collaboration or contracts and very important collaborations with the Willigan Aboriginal Corporation and also with the Dumbi Mangari uh, Aboriginal Corporation and the Department of Defence. And then further 1.8 million hectares where we help other pastoral leaseholders to execute their early dry season burn programs. When it was just AWC and our land area was relatively small, uh, the process was fairly easy. But as we've, oops, as we've moved on, um, things have become much more complicated. And in 2019, uh, during the, the fire season in 2019, let me get that out of just click on the screen, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, we realised that, that our current systems were not going to suit us well into the future. Uh, as a result of that, in 2020, the Northwest team in AWC was tasked with a review of the processes and particularly with developing a more structured approach to fire management and uh, with, with an approach that particularly addressed the, the broad range of risks that are associated with managing fire. So I won't go into much of this in detail, but I just want uh, to let you know that as we were going through the season, we were developing this more structured, uh, more targeted framework. And it included early in the season, the development of a strategic risk matrix. So we knew the sorts of risks we were trying to deal with. Uh, the writing of a fire operations framework that was basically aimed at trying to make sure that we looked after all those values on country that are important, not only to AWC, but also to our partners and neighbours. And then a fire incident response plan, which is a structured approach to dealing with wildfire response that looks after people primarily to make sure that when we put people out into the field, they're safe. And those things led to a revamp of our burn plan format for our early dry season burn program to uh, the idea of GIS risk maps and what we've called priority mapping. We've done priority mapping for carbon, uh, sorry, for ecological values. We're working with Willigan at the moment to develop carbon mapping. And there are, there's a possibility of developing mapping for a whole range of values. And then finally, to uh, the creation of a new thing, a daily operations plan for our late dry season fire suppression. And as I said, I won't go into these things in detail, but just so you get a bit of a, a view of what they are, this is the front page of one of our early dry season burn plans. And you can see on the other side of the screen, uh, the, the flight lines associated with that burn plan and, and, uh, and the scarring uh, and the ferry lines as well. The ecological priority mapping, it was a first cut, so it's fairly broad at this stage, but you can see we've uh, classified the country that we uh, help to manage up here into five priority zones, priorities five being the lowest priority in terms of ecological values, priority one being the highest. And then that enabled us to move into our late dry season with a bit of an action table around those priority zones. So you can see zones one to five listed down the left-hand side there. Um, anything from no action down the bottom right up to rapid response up the top. But of course, overriding all of this is the basic safety requirements. Um, the daily operations plan, as I said, we create one of these every day for every fire that we're actually actively working on. And this is primarily a tool, but it serves a couple of functions. The first is to communicate to people in the field what we need done on the day, um, but it's also a great vehicle for communicating between us and our partners and other people who are involved in fire management. So everybody understands what we're about. Everybody's in agreement that the plans we're putting in place are plans that are broadly supported. 
Uh, and then, of course, it's never just one fire. Um, this is the lightning map for 72 hours over the central Kimberley. Um, and you can see there's a whole bunch of fires sitting under that lightning. And in the days subsequent to this map, a few more sprang up as well. So we have a, what we call a coordination tool, which is just a basic database of all the fires that are running, uh, which we update on a daily basis. And you can see there's a column there named today and then a column with comments. Basically, every day we assess every fire and we make a decision about whether or not we're going to do anything in particular uh, with that fire. And we write that decision down. Those decisions are archived, they're communicated, they're jointly made between us and, and our partners, uh, and then they're communicated to everybody involved so everybody knows what's going on. So that's just uh, that was one side of what we were doing. We decided to run that process in parallel with our fire season because it gave us a great opportunity to road test each of those things as we put them in place. We wanted them to be a framework. We wanted them to be fit for purpose. Um, we wanted them to be really functional. They weren't really there to tick a box. They were more to help and make sure that we were doing uh, the right thing and, and doing it in a coordinated way and allocating our resources as efficiently as possible. So the early dry season, how did it go? Well, it went for us much the same as everybody else in the, the Kimberley. Uh, we flew an awful lot of kilometres. We dropped an awful lot of incendiaries. We were aiming for 25 to 30% SCAR. Uh, we achieved just 15%. We set ourselves clear targets. We put in a lot more effort. We started earlier, we finished later, and we ended up with less than in 2019. So it was a bit frustrating, but uh, as Rich and, and John and others have talked about so far, 2019 was very dry. We had a big season, wildfire season in 2019, another poor wet coming into the season, rainfall, mid-early dry season, and then the COVID-19 uh, inefficiencies, which we talked about briefly with uh, Dummy and Gary. Um, overall, we were, we were nervous, uh, to say the least, going into the late dry season and, and a little bit frustrated. So how did the late dry season go? Well, 2020 versus 2019, we dealt with 58 fires uh, as opposed to 23. But if you look at the total area burned, um, fairly similar area burned, and we've got an approximate figure for 2020 because we still haven't done the detailed GIS analysis, but a similar number of person days, similar number of chopper hours. We were aiming for a 75 to 25% ratio burn EDS to late DS, uh, and we achieved a 70 to 30. So our balance between early and dry se late seasons were, was reasonably good. And we were aiming for less than 35% total burn for the whole year, and we achieved 20%, 27%. So when you take that 27% and you apply it to the 30% 30, 30 uh, late dry season, our late dry season was actually probably well within, well within the envelope we'd set. Just wanted to make two points about our new, new approach to fire. The first is that for the first time we're, we're explicitly saying that we're not aiming to exclude late season fire. Instead, what, what we're trying to do is set ourselves a reasonable target to limit that fire to. And what that does is it gives us the ability, uh, what I call won't power. And that column I've highlighted on this slide, 321 represents the number of Point times when we sat and looked at a fire on an individual day and said, no, we're not going to do anything with this fire. Mm -hmm. And that's either due to resource constraints or because we were satisfied that the early dry season uh, scarring network was sufficient or, or at this stage, the risks associated with trying to tackle that fire were just too high. So all in all, uh, it was a really interesting year for us last year, really challenging year. We, had, we worked really closely with our partners. We were really pleased with the increased collaboration we had there. And the uh, results of the season were, in the end, um, what we had hoped for. Yes. So thanks, everyone. Uh, great one. Thanks very much for that, Alad. Um, really interesting to see what AWC are doing with, with all their assessment tools now um, and, and the, the amount of data that they're dealing with to, to make decisions is, is really effective. So we've just been uh, given the, the wrap up. So um, I'll just say thanks very much to everybody and sorry we went a little bit over time. Um, but yeah, back to Darwin.